So now it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Stephen Chu, the United States Secretary of the Department of Energy. Secretary Chu is here today wearing both his secretary hat and his scientist hat. Regarding his scientific work, it's a particular thrill to have Dr. Chu speak at this meeting because he exemplifies better than anyone the connections that can be made between biology and physics, an important theme of this meeting as you just heard from Tony. Secretary Chu was born a scientist and a tinkerer. As a small child, he would build elaborate constructions out of erector sets on his living room floor. And then as a high school student, capitalizing on that acquired skill of erector set building, he built a physical pendulum to make precise measurements of gravity. 25 years later, at Bell Labs, his designs became more sophisticated. He used six powerful lasers impinging at different angles to confine and trap atoms so they can be studied with unprecedented precision. So starting off with an erector set at age 10, Dr. Dr. Chu ended up holding a Nobel Prize in Physics at age 49 for his pioneering work on atom trapping. And the laser optical traps for cooling atoms also could be used for, to manipulate and study individual biological molecules. And being quick to perceive new opportunities, Dr. Chu then moved part of his research effort into biology. And he pioneered the use of optical traps as well as other methods from physics uh, to understand the physical properties of DNA and to understand RNA and protein folding. And even the move to become Secretary of Energy in 2009 hasn't slowed down Dr. Chu's productivity and research. In 2010, he published uh, two papers in the prestigious journal Nature that demonstrate the span of his intellect. One paper was in physics on gravitational redshift, and the other was in light microscopy and developing new methods that would have particular applications for the life sciences. And it, he also has a number of other exciting projects in the work that he'll talk about today. Thus, Chu is a true leader in the fields of physics and biology and a pioneer in making connections between the two, which is uh, a, an important future for cell biology. Dr. Chu is also wearing a Secretary of Energy hat, and it's worth knowing the Department of Energy is one of the main funders of science and indeed the federal, ener federal agency that initially funded the Human Genome Project. So we're lucky to have someone so deeply thoughtful uh, to help think ahead and plan for the world's uh, future energy needs. So thank you, Dr. Chu, for being here at the ACB meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the U.S. Secretary of Energy and Nobel Laureate, Dr. Stephen Chu. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, uh, it's, uh, if there's a, any little warts in the talk, I have to confess that I, I've been preparing it as you were walking in the room. Um, anyway, uh, the theme of how physical sciences can help uh, cell biology and biomedical sciences actually goes back uh, a half a century. <clears throat> and there's been a long tradition. Indeed, if you look back at the history of uh, contributions that physical sciences has made to the biological sciences, to cell biology, and, and to medicine, it's pretty remarkable. Um, over 50 Nobel laureates in physiology or medicine or chemistry that were given for contributions in biology were actually trained as physicists or physical scientists. Um, at, at least that man, many, but there may be more. Um, uh, maybe they are still in the closet. Anyway, I, I just want to say the first physics Nobel Prize actually had a profound impact on um, medicine. Uh, this is Rankin. Uh, he was using this tube that you see below that would uh, emit electrons and then go hit on the back side of this tube. And he began to notice there were some strange things happening to photographic film in a drawer. And uh, this one thing led to another, and he discovered what he called x-rays. And this is the famous picture of his wife's hand and her wedding ring. Uh, so even though he was a dedicated scientist, he was married. <laughs> uh, there are many, many other uh, contributions to imaging that have been made. Uh, these are just a sampling, 19, 
74 chemistry Nobel Prize for radioactive isotopes that led to the remarkable positron emission tomography, or PET scans. Uh, the CT scans, uh, also invented by a physicist and then improved by uh, an electrical engineer. And there were numerous uh, awards in nuclear magnetic resonance that led to magnetic resonance imaging and um, molecular structures. So the theme of this is, uh, you know, careers in science, and certainly my career in science, doesn't really happen with a clear vision and you decide what to do early in life and then just follow that. Uh, sometimes things just happen by accident. So let me, let me step back and show you, uh, indeed, what I mean by that. This is a picture of my mother and father uh, getting married and my father's oldest sister. Very, very good-looking couple. And I'm as a second child, and this is what I look like <laughs> on a bare hair day. So, uh, you, know, you know, there's, uh, I don't know if you call it mutations, but there's genetic variation. Uh, <laughs> when I went to uh, graduate school, I was indeed a physicist, and not only a physicist, but a physicist was mostly concerned with uh, very fundamental questions in high energy physics. And uh, there was me as a graduate student uh, posed before a laser that uh, I designed and built to do a particular experiment. Uh, there's another successive la uh, successor laser that I did uh, built as a postdoc. And this was actually to test a theory that unified the electromagnetic interactions that were discovered, well, by Faraday and Maxwell and others in the middle 1860s with uh, the weak nuclear forces responsible for beta decay that were explored in the 1930s. And in the mid-1960s, some theoretical physicists said, you know, this is just one in manifestation of the same theory. And so as part of my, as my thesis and postdoctoral work, we actually tested this theory. Um, now, for that, uh, I then, uh, after my postdoc, they made me assistant professor at Berkeley. But it was very unusual. I had been there for eight years as a graduate student and a postdoc. They said, well, you can start your group now, or you can take a year or two leave of absence and go somewhere. So I said, that sounds great. I'll take the job, and I'll go to Bell Labs. And while at Bell Labs, I did a number of things. But I was introduced to an interesting question by a colleague of mine, Arthur Ashkin, Art Ashkin. And he asked the question, can you actually hold on to particles like a magic wand? Now, the way we usually hold on to particles is we actually take our fingers and squeeze on them. And if you have a fictitious microscope that is atomically, with atomic resolution, you find that the atoms of your finger and the atoms of this marble that you're holding on to actually distort the, the uh, electric fields. And there's repulsive forces allow you to hold on to this. But that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to hold on to it like a magic wand, sort of like this, um, tractor beam style. And uh, this is, again, a picture of me when I was at Bell Labs and uh, my colleague Art Ashkin. Now, in those days, when I got there, uh, the focus was on holding on to atoms. And can you hold on to atoms with laser beams? And uh, it turned out that you could if you got them very cold. And this is a picture of uh, laser cooling that Ron Vale talked about, where you use laser beams to cool atoms, in this case down to about a quarter of a uh, 250 millionth of a degree above absolute zero. We now have techniques that can cool atoms down to uh, less than a billionth of a degree above absolute zero. So it's very, very cold. Once these atoms are that cold, you can do what you will with them. They're just like sitting ducks. And so we started doing that. And in 1986, we demonstrated the first trap. But as we were working on this first atom trap, <clears throat> uh, Art Ashkin said, maybe we should do a little play experiment. And so he set up an experiment in his laboratory that said, instead of this exotic laser cooling method to get the atoms very cold and then hold on to them with a focus beam, he went in his lab and said, use water and a little plastic polystyrene sphere about a micron in diameter, and said, can I hold on to that? And it worked. It worked remarkably well, and a, f a month or two later, the other experiment worked. And so Art Ashkin went on to use this trap, which he actually published years ago, but never bothered seeing if it would really work, to actually hold on to all sorts of things, bacteria, organelles, 
and it set in motion um, the optical trapping work of, of stuff in water. Now, in 1987, I uh, left Bell Labs to, re to go back to Stanford, and in, uh, shortly thereafter, in the late 1980s, I started working on the following idea. We can hold on to atoms with a single focus laser beam. We can hold on to bacteria with a single focus laser beam. Can you hold on to an individual molecule? And the idea would be to hold on to a molecule, for example, of DNA by gluing two polystyrene beads. And then using laser beams focused by the microscope, can you actually grab onto them? And so this is a movie of such an early work. This is the polystyrene sphere. This is a DNA molecule. It's a single molecule. You can see it in an optic microscope because we sprinkled fluorescent dye molecules on it, so it would just fluoresce. And um, <clears throat> so this was in the late 1980s, and uh, the laser beam uh, was controlled, pointed by a joystick, and it becomes a video game. And so what happens is you can go around and do this. And, um, and so this uh, turned out to be very, very cool. The earliest work on this uh, was actually done because it wasn't fully funded. It wasn't actually funded. It was done on the sly. So actually, I used an undergraduate student uh, and myself and a postdoc. No, it was a graduate student of Jim Spudish to teach me a little biochemistry to glue this polystyrene sphere to the DNA. And so we started doing a number of experiments. And we found remarkably that um, these identical molecules if placed in identical physical situations, would actually act differently. They would act as, quote, individuals. A molecule would do a certain thing. The same molecule, same condition, would do some slightly different, do slightly different. And, and this was um, actually coined molecular individualism, not by us, but by Pierre de Gen, a Nobel laureate in polymer physics, who said he didn't really believe it, so how can it molecules act as individuals? And so this is a standard reaction to any novel scientific discovery. The first reaction is, it's wrong. The second reaction is, after you understand it, it's trivial. And then, and then very quickly, they remind you, you're not the first to discover it. <clears throat> so you know you're, if you're onto something big if you begin to see those reactions. <laughs> uh, now, there are a number of single molecule pioneers, uh, and I just wanted to mention just a smattering of it. Uh, W.E. Murner, who was the first to see the single absorption of a, of a dye molecule. Steve Block, who worked with optical tweezers. Jim Spudich, who did pioneering experiments with actin myosin system. Shimon Weiss, Paul Selvin, I think a couple of these people I think are here, but even if they're not here, they were pioneers. <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> In any case, there are many, many other people who've, who've, um, who've done spectacular work. I do want to uh, brag about some of the people in my group. Steve Quake was the undergraduate who first uh, got to tweeze DNA. He did two summers work uh, as an undergraduate at Stanford. He got his honors thesis with me. He then wanted to go into high energy physics string theory uh, at Oxford, but his last year he decided to go back to polymer physics, so he came back to my lab, did more experiments and then he stayed two more years as a postdoc. So I had him as an undergraduate, a graduate student, and a postdoc, so he's totally warped. <laughs> Tech Ji Pa was a, a student of Shimon Weiss, a uh, postdoc of mine, Xiao Wei Zong, Ben Xiao These are uh, fantastic people who have passed through my group, and there are many, many more. So now let me change uh, topics and talk a little bit about some recent progress in the physical sciences and how it can help cell biology. And the first thing is, how do you break the diffraction barrier of optical microscopy. Very fundamental physical law that says, because of the, length, the wavelength of light, you can only get to a certain resolution. And so, uh, if you have a single, oops, if you have a single point source, uh, and you look at it with the most sensitive op optical microscopy, you see a blur circle uh, that has a radius, if you will, uh, an uncertainty size, of around 250 nanometers. And this is uh, work taken by, uh, from Paul Selvin's group. But Paul and his colleagues ask a different question. The fundamental optical resolution is the width of this blur circle. But you've asked a different question. Where is the center of the blur circle? 
That depends on the diffraction limit divided by the signal to noise of your the signal to noise of whatever you're detecting, which ultimately depends on how many photons you can detect. Now, so this is a schematic of pixels. This is the lead pixel, other side pixels. And you can find the center, you know, you can eyeball the center of this, and you say it's clearly less than one pixel. I can find the center of this blur circle, all right? So then you can ask another question. Suppose you're looking for the center of this blur circle. What's the ultimate limitation? We ask that question, and suppose you look at, the, for example, this pixel, and instead of your camera being sensitive to this signal, it gives you this, this, oh, this is the center of the blur circle. But in this pixel, suppose you detect a little bit more electrical current than, the, than some, um, well, you know, just pretend it's slightly different by a percent per pixel. And then when you do that, it actually shifts the center of the blur circle. Since we're finding the center of the blur circle to about one hundredth of one pixel, little differences in the sensitivity can actually in, in, uh, generate errors. So the question we pose, uh, can you actually localize better than 10 nanometers, which is about the best that uh, groups were doing, and to quote my boss, yes, we can. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how we do that. Uh, that was one of the papers that Ron mentioned that was published in 2010. But Alexandros, uh, a postdoc and a, a, a Yun Chang a graduate student, figured out how to do this. And they actually got um, better than one nanometer, about seven angstrom resolution they actually got to the shot noise limit based on the number of photons you detected. And so this is something uh, that's very exciting. Another great development happened, and this was due to, um, again, two physical, si three physical scientists, Eric Betzig and Harold Hess, formerly of Bell Labs, now at Janelia Farms, Howard Hughes, and Xiaowei Zhang, uh, my former postdoc. And they said, okay, we can find the center of this object to much better than the optical resolution, one-tenth, one-twentieth of the optical resolution. But suppose you then looked at it and said, you find one dot of light, find out where that center is, allow another dot of light to appear, find out where that center is, and so on and so forth. And from that, you build up an image. But each fluorescent molecule is centered and found well below the optical resolution of the microscope. And so then that, you can actually construct a three-dimensional image of what is going on. So now I'm going to go to some very recent work. Um, this is my last postdoc when I became Secretary of Energy. I had a, a group of a, roughly 15 or so. And it takes a while to, you know, have them finish their work and publish. And so although it looks like I'm working, uh, I can assure all the taxpayers in this room that the first 75 hours of my week go to the Department of Energy. <laughs> And uh, this is done at weekends and at nights at really strange hours of the day. So this is Vassell Burke, who happens to be sitting in the audience. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about some recent work he's done and continuing to do. And it has to do with visualizing biofilms. So what's a biofilm? If you have individual bacteria and they land on a surface, they can, in fact, form a colony. And this colony uh, is called a biofilm. and they these bacteria excrete proteins, uh, polymers, and these proteins and polymers actually protect the bacteria from reactions to uh, host invasion. So suppose you get invaded by some uh, bacteria and wants to form a biofilm, you will generate antibodies and all sorts of things that will try to eat these bacteria. And uh, this is one example. This is a uh, a type of white blood cell, a phagocyte, uh, that happens to be eating uh, an anthrax bacilli. Uh, and so it's engulfing them, and it digests it, and spits out the little pieces, and the bacteria is rendered um, with all fundamentally dead. So, so the biofilms will actually erect these barriers and a community to protect themselves against this biological warfare. Other things where you find biofilms on the bottoms of uh, uh, boats. Uh, they form these very, very tough uh, scaly things that um, degrade, they drag on the, uh, the vessel. Um, 
They can degrade the fuel efficiency by 20 percent, and it's a multi-billion dollar business a year in the United States just to scrape this stuff off the bottoms of ships, which has to be done in dry dock. Very tough stuff. Finally, um, understanding biofilms can actually help us make potentially a new class of biofuels. And to that, I show you this uh, picture of, you know, if you're a homeowner, uh, this is really disturbing. These are wood termites. And uh, wood termites use wood, they eat it, and they use it as bioenergy. Now, if we ate wood, it would not be not only very appetizing, it wouldn't be very nutritious. We just pass it through our system. And so these wood turbines actually have developed the ability to digest this very tough woody material and turn it into biofuel for their own use. But in fact, they don't use it, turn that um, woody material themselves. They have a lot of help. And if this is the gut of a termite, and if you look inside the gut of a termite, you find bacterial colonies in the form of biofilms. And these biofilms actually break down the woody cellulose material and turn it into a digestible form that the termite can use. So the termite shreds it with the mandibles, but then the bacteria do a lot of the chemical work. And so it's understanding biofilms have all these applications. Now, our approach to biofilms is very simple. We took inspiration from the great American philosopher of the 20th century. In case you're wondering who that is, that happens to be Yogi Berra. Uh, Yogi Berra is having a philosophical conversation over on the right, and uh, he said many very wise things. He said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. Uh, he, he said, uh, predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. But at this particular uh, wise saying is, you can observe a lot by just watching. So this is what we want to do. We just want to watch with higher resolution. So here's, pretend you, here's a bacterial cell or any kind of cell. And you have these fluorescent dye molecules by these red stars and you want to identify particular proteins or polysaccharides. So you develop an antibody that will uh, stick onto a particular protein. But when these, this assembly is actually in solution, they kind of move around and diffuse around very rapidly. And because they're diffusing around very rapidly, what your camera ends up seeing is a blurred, fuzzy, dim picture of this. However, if this fluorescent molecule with this antibody happens to attach to a cell which is on the surface, it becomes unmobilized, you have a single dot of light which you can find the center of with high precision. So you see out of this very faint blur, you see these little points of light lighting up. And so that's what Vassell has done. And so this is a movie, the, we start with a confocal microscope movie of a biofilm. This is a normal microscope picture of biofilms growing on a surface. And you see how these films establish themselves and grow. And he's now scanning up uh, in the microscope and seeing um, how thick they are and all these other things. So now we're going to go to uh, looking at uh, this movie, but in slow motion, and looking at it assemble also in three dimensions. And because we can actually identify different proteins, and polysaccharides, uh, we can actually form these three-dimensional images of uh, many of the components of the biofilm as well as uh, the bacteria themselves. And so in this animation of the data, what you see is, as you zoom in, as this growing biofilm structure is a beginning biofilm structure, and you see the blue are the cells. Uh, you see, for example, in the red, uh, these are shell proteins that actually make this. There's also proteins that act as cements or glue for this object. And then finally, there are other proteins, the green colored stuff, that actually establishes the biofilm locally. And so you can actually make these three-dimensional pictures. They're really movies. So for the first time, we now are able to see live biofilms growing in pretty good resolution. But let me show you what you can learn by just watching. If you look at a cross-section of these biofilms, you see that, well, there are clusters over here, and there are these little spaces. And so we're conjecturing that these spaces and channels and grooves are actually regions where nutrients can diffuse in to feed these individual cells, and waste products can diffuse out. So this is your primitive circulatory system, 
and um, we're trying to do an experiment. I don't know when it's going to be done. You can maybe diffuse in molecules, use a laser, cross-link them, and cut off the circulation channels and see if it kills the biofilm. That would be big news for medicine because that's a way of actually killing these biofilms. Antibiotics, antibodies do not work. Uh, but it can have a lot of other applications. Let's go to super resolution. If you use a conventional optical microscope, and this is a 200 nanometer bar, you'll see a blur circle, something like this. This is what you see of a single bacteria excreting these biofilm proteins. Again, it's a movie, but this is a still of that movie. Okay? And then you can magnify in that dotted line box, and you see uh, with, again, 200 nanometer bar, you see actually really exquisite resolution, something on the order of 15 nanometers, again, of a growing live biofilm. And you can make a three-dimensional image of that live and growing. So this is very, very exciting. And uh, the next step uh, in my former group uh, if, is to actually apply this to live um, cells, uh, human cells. One last little thing I'm going to talk about, my second to last postdoc, who's just got an assistant professor job, Shaolin Nan, is doing something else. If you look at a cell, and it's the interaction of the cells, just as single molecules don't tell you the whole story, even single cells don't tell you the whole story. And cells talk to the other cells in any, t in any organism. And this is a schematic of the cell membrane. They communicate, cells communicate with each other quite often. Uh, one way of communicating is to have um, receptor uh, proteins impinged on the membrane, and you have these cells signaling. This thing goes, attaches to this uh, receptor, and then it undergoes a series of chemical reactions. In this case, uh, there's are so-called kinases that get phosphorylated. And this all occurs on the cell membrane. Now, the si specific signaling process we're looking at is uh, something having to do with what's called the RAS, RAF, these are two of the signaling molecules, um, signaling pathway. And with this signal, you, uh, if you actually get the cell to go, get moving on this, it actually tells the cell, should you grow, should you divide, what should you do? And that's why it's so important, because cells don't want to undergo uncontrolled cell division. If they lose their ability to be regulated by this outside receptor, this is bad news. And in fact, two-thirds of all human cancers are due to the fact that this RAS or RAF molecule undergo mutations. And when they undergo mutations, they don't need signals from the outside of the cell to tell you the cell to divide. They just start dividing like crazy by themselves. So, so we decided to study this signaling pathway. What we did is we took mutant molecules, cloned a gene for a fluorescent molecule onto these. And let me tell you about one thing that you may have heard of, it's a, um, a new drug that's uh, uh, very effective against treating malignant melanoma. And the hypothesis was that uh, these two RAF, mutant RAF molecules, because they're mutated, they can come together, form a dimer, and without outside signals from the surrounding tissue, they will say, all right, time to activate this pathway. And when they activate the pathway, it leads to uncontrolled cell growth and tumors. And so uh, the company Plexion said, well, if we have a small molecule and that would attach to these mutant molecules, it would actually prevent these two mutant molecules from forming a dimer. Therefore, it stops the uncontrolled cell signaling pathway. Therefore, it should stop the cancer. And in fact, indeed, for three quarters of the patients, it does this remarkably well without side effects. Very, very targeted, only on the mutant molecule. And, um, it was one of those wonderful cures that, uh, w you know, partway into the drug testing program, they just stopped it and said, it's working so well, we'll give it to the, the control group because it's going to work. All right. So go back to our imaging. In order to test this hypothesis, what you do is you take an antibody. Conventionally, you stick a small gold particle onto it. You see if it attaches to this mutant molecule. But the sensitivity is not so good. So you actually have to make you overexpress the mutant molecule, and with overexpressing the mutant molecule, you can actually see if they're forming clusters or dimers. And 
In so doing, you find, yes, indeed, you're forming clusters or dimers. But there's always a nagging suspicion that this overexpression is an artifact of the experiment. If you make a lot of stuff, they would, might naturally cluster together. But the sensitivity of uh, electron microscopy and this immunoassay wouldn't allow you to see at a level that would actually start signaling. So enter single molecule. And so with super resolution, we actually first show that we, these dye molecules don't cluster by themselves uh, without anything. So we look at the wild type, healthy cells, and we just look and we see individual dots of light, no dimers. And there are statistical tests to show there's no dimers. And what we find with mutant forms of molecules, you actually see, as in this arrow, little dumbbells forming. You can see it by your eye, well, your eye assisted by some pretty good cameras. Uh, and, and you can actually see that dimers are forming. Now, the most important part of this is we then said, all right, we can regulate how many of the mutant molecules you express in the cell by using uh, a standard biological technique. And when we regulate that, we can downregulate it so no, dim no dimers form or there's no downstream signaling, therefore no uh, cell growth. And then we just turn up the regulation slowly and surely. And what we find is about two orders of magnitude below the sensitivity of EM microscopy, it forms dimers and it allows further cell signaling. Okay? Because we have high, high resolution sensitivity in single molecules, all of a sudden, far better than an electron microscope, uh, we can see in a wet cell what's happening. And so this was done with fixed, you know, you wait for a while, fix the cell, and the next step is do it in a live cell. And then the third step, and it's work being done with Axel Brunger, is to be begin to use these, we are doing this now, but to use these super resolution imaging techniques in tissue, three-dimensional, 10, 15 nanometer resolution, and then live tissue. So it's um, pretty darn exciting. Now, why would I go work for the government <laughs> when I'm having so much fun. Uh, well, because um, I really, maybe a dozen years ago, got very concerned about climate change. And uh, this is a record of 1880 to 2000, actually it goes now back to 1800, of the average temperature of uh, the Earth. And there are bumps and wiggles, but the long-term trend um, uh, is that the temperature seems to be rising. Uh, you can't really uh, say over a five or even a 10 year trend what's really happening. But if you look 50 years, 100 years, it seems to be rising. And certainly over the last 30 years, you know, a lot of public attention over the last couple years has been paid to unusual number, seemingly unusual number of droughts and wildfires and, and floods and uh, strong hurricanes and things like that. But again, I caution you, you can't tell that from a few years. Don't jump to any conclusion. Here's a 30-year record of what was happening, and there seems to be some trend going on. Uh, this is compiled by a reinsurance company because they have to insure for this stuff, and so it matters. So, so something is happening. It's, there have been long-term trends going back three, four decades. And it's getting very costly in terms of just economic losses, but also human suffering. And uh, so it's a big deal. And uh, quite candidly, I became convinced that humans had a lot to do with it from their carbon emissions. I said, what can I do to help? All right. So I'm just going to take, tell you about one little aspect of that uh, in my job as uh, energy secretary. But you can use biology to actually potentially make biofuels. But before I tell you that, I need to give you a primer on the jungle warfare between plants and microbes. Plants, you know, get attacked by all sorts of things, insects, parasites, fungi, uh, and microbes. And what they do is they erect defenses against the onslaught of this attack. And in fact, if you look at this, the really easy to digest stuff, this is the starches and sugars that are, constitute fruit, or nuts and things like that. They're actually protected by sheaths like this uh, surrounding this corn cob, or nuts, this is Christmas time, so that's a water chestnut. But they're actually protected by pretty hard shell durable stuff. Um, if you look 
at, at a plant, and the, most of the material of a plant is this very woody, tough material, not designed to be eaten by either microbes uh, or animals. <coughs> Turns out most of the mass, the dry mass of the plant, is in the cell wall. And if you look in this blow up of this is one cell, cartoon of a cell, and you look inside this cell wall, you, what you find are there these so-called macrofibrils that are essentially kind of look like woven tough cables. Those woven tough cables, if you look and we'll blow that up, has this very uh, complex multi-ringed uh, molecules called lignin that's very protective, and inside that there's even other stuff which are long chains of polymers, and they're in fact crystals of simple sugars. But they don't have, the simple sugar is easily digested by a microbe, uh, but if you make them into long polymers, it's hard to digest, and then further you surround it by this lignin stuff. So this is part of the protection of a plant, and what you really want to do is have access to these simple sugars, these long polymer chains, if you look at them, these little symbols down here are the simple sugars like glucose that are easily digested by yeast or bacteria. This is an electron structure of an enzyme that's peeling out this long chain of sugars. This is the steel cables, and they take, oops, they take one cap, uh, cable of this, and it goes and munches on it and turns this long cable of uh, sugar called cellulose into individual glucose molecules. And so what we do is we try to make better enzymes that can break this down faster. Now, let me tell you an exciting development that's happening in so-called field of directed evolution. So what is directed evolution? You take an organism, and uh, normal evolution undergoes yeah, random mutations due to all, all sorts of things, and you form you know, progeny, like my parents formed progeny. Um, and in directed evolution, what you do is you induce mutations by, for example, radiation or chemical means. You find progeny and you say, ah, what's the best characteristic I'm looking for? Um, you know, something that's easier to digest in a plant or, say, you know, a great basketball player, you name it. Uh, and then, uh, well, microbes don't play basketball. Um, and you pick that best progeny and you make it undergo more mutations by radiation or chemical means, and then you pick the best of that, and so on and so forth. Now, that's one way of doing it. You want to accelerate that, and so you accelerate it by doing a little bit of shuffling. Instead of picking the best phenotype, you might pick the top four phenotypes that you want and do a little shuffling, so you get more variation, and then evolve that, okay? So it's more of a... It's the difference between minor uh, mutations and accelerated mutations. And the idea is very simple. In normal evolution, um, most progeny don't survive. Uh, they just die. They, they don't mature. But what this is doing is actually, instead of having certain distributions, you're forcing it to have wider distributions, still looking for survivors, but you're looking always at the tail of the phenotype you want, and because you have a wider distribution, at least some survivors, you can go faster in accelerating the evolution. And so this has been happening, and indeed, there are even better ways where you don't pick the best. It turns out if you pick, you allow some of the, quote, bad genes to go in there and do deeper shuffling, you have a wider distribution. Against most of them are not going to work, but the good ones work, and you can accelerate uh, evolution even faster. So this is one way of accelerating the development of enzymes, and it works really well. Uh, another way of trying to develop biofuels is um, actually very, very clever, but a little gruesome. Here's a, a, a corn, but you want to digest the woody material, the hard to digest material, the corn cobs or the stalks. And so there are enzymes, like the one I showed you, that actually break down this woody material. But if you ask a question, can you get the plant to grow the enzyme that's going to digest itself? Now, at first you say, no, nah, that's not going to work, because if the plant grows the enzyme that's going to digest itself, it's not going to have a very happy life because it's digesting itself. And indeed, that's true. They don't survive. But if you took this enzyme, which is an amino acid sequence, and put into it uh, 
an amino acid sequence called an N team. And what this N team does, very much like um, some of the RNAs, if you expose it to a different condition, the N team, this string of amino acids, comes together, splices itself out of the original amino acid chain and floats away. The original amino acid chain is now intact and folds into an active enzyme. So the idea is exposed to an unusual condition. In the case of this company, very high heat. The entine splices itself away and it digests itself. Since the enzyme is the most expensive part of this process, this is a way of introducing this. It's also a way of making a lot of uh, food products more digestible for animals. So again, this is a, a way of uh, biology um, actually making advances in plants. Um, another final, I don't know if it's fine, but another last thing is, has to do with um, um, plants going through stages of development. Uh, there's a juvenile stage, there, I'm not sure, there's a teenage stage, and then there's an adult stage in plants. And as a plant matures into a, the adult stage, its protection mechanisms are strengthened. And so what we're doing is we're funding some research that when you put a gene a particular gene into this plant. Uh, it's not actually the gene, but it's actually RNA interference, an associated RNA molecule that keeps the plant from going into adult, full adulthood. And when the plant doesn't go into a full adulthood, it doesn't build up all these protective mechanisms. Uh, it's got 250% more starch in the plant cell walls than a mature plant, and it's easier to extract the sugars. And it's RNA interference, which only discovered about a half dozen years ago, is now being asked to make better biofuels. So again, these are examples of some of the things. Finally, synthetic biology, even a bigger step. You introduce not a set of genes, but a whole metabolic pathway with all the promoters and regulators. And uh, this has been used by Jay Kiesling to make an, an anti-malaria drug. Uh, it used to be extracted from a plant in Southeast Asia. Uh, it can now be grown in yeast or bacteria, uh, and it can be produced 10 times more cheaply than the extraction from the plant. And now this has actually gone into production as an anti-malaria drug. The same technology that you're using in synthetic biology are, is actually being used to engineer microbes, yeast and bacteria. You feed it biomass, and instead of producing ethanol, which is a wonderful biofuel, but it should be drunk, not use and put in an automobile, um, uh, you want to produce diesel or jet fuel or gasoline. And so these bacteria are now producing those ingredients when fed simple sugars. Next step is to feed them complex cellulose. So these are examples of the power of biology and cell biology and how they can help make an impact on, um, on our energy issues. Let me close two last slides by a message to the younger students. Um, uh, this was true in my career and it's true of all my students and postdocs. Uh, uh, I've been asked and I ask them to aim as high as you can. And uh, this is a quote from Michelangelo it's saying, the greatest, greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. So aim high, expect to fail, fail fast, and move on. Uh, now, a competitor of Michelangelo's was um, Leonardo da Vinci, and he said something about applying this basic knowledge. He said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Being willing is not enough, we must do. Hence, I'm a government bureaucrat. Um, last image, um, one of my favorites. It was taken on Christmas Eve, 1968. Uh, this is the first mission that circled the moon, uh, Apollo 8. And in the last orbit, they decided to turn the capsule uh, towards Earth. And one of the astronauts took this picture of what's called moonrise. So uh, here you see a very bleak lunar landscape, a very inviting Earth. And there's a take-home message here. There's nowhere else to go. And so uh, the concerns I had for the environment and the concerns of sustainability, it was actually made me go into um, bureaucracy. And um, the astronaut who took this picture said, we came all this way to explore the moon 
and the most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. Now since that time, uh, we've discovered we are changing the destiny of the Earth, and it's very important to try to mitigate those risks as much as possible. Thank you.